application theory. So, okay. So remember, um, before that we had terms like cross entropy loss and so on thrown around. So the question is, you know, what does that even mean? And this is really the super light skimmed milk version of information theory that I'm going to cover. Um, really just enough to make sense out of the other things that we're doing. So entropy, um, the question that uh, Shannon started out with is, you know, let's say I have some data source producing observations x1 through xn. It's so like, how much information is there in the source? Can we quantify this in some meaningful way? So for instance, if I have, you know, a fair coin, then at each step, of, you know, the surprise is, you know, whether it's heads or tails. Now, if I roll a fair dice, you know, I get, you know, six possible outcomes, and there should be more information in that than tossing a coin. And then maybe, you know, maybe tossing two, tossing two coins has more information than a dice, or maybe not, and then you can argue about it. And it's kind of tricky. Or if you think about it, you know, I could take a picture of a white wall versus a picture of this lecture theater, and obviously, if I take a picture of all of you, this contains a lot more information than just taking a picture of a white wall. And the nice way that how Shannon formulated this is by saying, well, the entropy is the minimum number of bits that are needed to store this. Okay, now, how do we formalize this? So this is the ingenious definition of Shannon's, uh, namely he defined the entropy H of P to be minus the sum over all outcomes J, PJ times log of PJ. So in other words, it's the expected value of minus log P. <coughs> and then there's this very famous coding theorem, namely that the entropy is the lower bound on the number of bits, or in this case rather nats, so base E, of that are needed. And we're going to prove this in this class. It's probably one of the more complex proofs that we'll do, um, but afterwards you'll feel that the entropy is a lot less mysterious than it would be otherwise. A couple of nice things, so the entropy itself is convex, since P log P is convex, right? So linear function P. Log P is not convex, but P log P is convex because it bends up further than the linear function. Um, but before we do that, let's actually look at a couple of things. Let's take a fair coin. So if I have a fair coin, well, the entropy of that is, you know, one half log base two of one half, then another half log base two of one half, and so that's one bit. And indeed, if I wanted to encode, you know, 10 coin tosses on a computer, I could just do that through a bit sequence. Now, if I have a biased coin, so which with 90% probability comes up heads and otherwise tails, then if you work out the numbers, <coughs> So 0.9 times log base 2 of 0.9 plus the corresponding thing for 0.1, I get around 41, 0.41 bit. So you can already intuitively see that a coin that mostly spits out, let's say, tails, should be easier to store as a sequence than something that you know, will th produce things at random. Now, if you've played Dungeons and Dragons, you know that, well, they don't muck around with regular dice. They use a 20-sided dice. And that 20-sided dice requires you to store around 4.3 bit. So there's a fair amount more information in each uh, roll of a dice than you would have in the standard coin toss. Okay. Um, in order to prove that theorem, we need to look a little bit at what prefix codes are and something called a Croft inequality. Yes? Uh, does this hypothesis prefix imply that the entropy should be something? So, like the so then that's correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, because. because yeah, absolutely right. Mm. 
Thank you. So now, let's look at something called the Croft inequality. So there's <coughs> a code. So codes are so-called prefix codes. If I can map every symbol into you know, a code, let's say, you know, of zeros and ones with some length L of X and where no sequence is a prefix of another code word. So for instance, I couldn't have as one code word dog and as another word code word doghouse. That wouldn't work because dog would be a prefix to doghouse. And prefix codes are very nice because they're very nice to decode. I just, you know, go and look things up and then, you know, I find something and then, you know, I go and pick the next term. And, <coughs> well, so for instance, you know, I can, if I look at the first terms, well, that's not, not a prefix code, right? Because the code for A would be a prefix for B, the code for B would be a prefix for C, the code for C would be a prefix for D. So that's pretty bad. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, I encode A as a zero. So now the only option that I have left is that I pick for B one and then zero. And okay, in that case, I burn up the one zero as well. So I, I can only do a one one, and then maybe zero, and then D, I'm just left with one one. Okay. So that would be a prefix code. Now here's a really cool inequality, the so-called Croft inequality, which says that if and only if, you know, we have a prefix code, then the following holds. One is greater or equal than the sum over all x's of two to the minus the length of that code. Okay. So this is a pretty powerful inequality. So, and to prove it, it's actually not that hard. So, first of all, we want to prove that this sum actually, if we have a prefix code, is bounded by one. So what we can do is we can just look at all the collisions. So basically I go and generate a random string, and I look at the probability that this random string actually happens to be a code word. Now, if I sum over all those probabilities, right, that has to be bounded by one because I can only hit at most one code word. So one is greater or equal than the probability of collision with some code word. So I can therefore sum over the probability that X is actually a hit. So only one of them is going to be active at any time. Now, since I generated a random string, the probability that it's a hit is given by two to the minus length of that string. Because it's a random binary string. Right? Because I have, you know, only zero and one, then the probability would be one half. If I have, you know, zero, zero, then you know the probability would be one quarter because I have now two symbols, and so on. And since on the very left-hand side of this we have as an upper bound one, we've just proven that if we have a prefix code, then the inequality holds. Okay. Now comes the harder bit to prove that if the inequality holds, then we can actually engineer prefix code. And <coughs> this is about the simplest proof I can come up with there are lots of other slightly more elaborate proofs. Uh, for instance, actually Wikipedia has one, but that may not be the simplest one. Anyway, this is the simplest I could come up with. So we are actually going to construct the prefix code explicitly recursively. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the set of X which have the shortest sequence, <coughs> well, which have the smallest L of, L of X. Okay, so I know that for those guys, because you know the left and some 
right, inside of that sum is one, right? So I know that for those guys, I can find a corresponding, you know, binary string and make them all unique quite easily, right? And then I have some rest of all the probabilities. Now what I do is, let's say for instance the length of the string is three, so I get two to the minus three, right? So I get one eighth. And maybe I have five of those guys, so I have three left. Now I take the remaining probabilities, which have to be less than three eighths, and split them up into groups of one eighth each. I then the corresponding signals for that. And now I multiply everything by two to the minus three, and I just recurse my algorithm of generating that prefix. I'm basically giving all the remaining probability chunks their own unique prefix, and then the rest is, you know, just applied it again to the rest. So in other words, all I'm doing is I'm just working my way from the head, the tail of my set of um, set of numbers, and whenever I find the next shortest term, I generate the prefix, and then you know apply the same mechanism to the subsets again. And so this way, at some point, I'll run out of things that I need to encode, and since at every time I didn't exhaust my entire budget of summing up to one, I'm done. It's only one tiny little problem if I have an infinite number of symbols, and this proof doesn't work for an infinite number of symbols. But for a finite one, it will. Okay. So why do we need all of this? Well, <coughs> actually for a very simple reason. <coughs> because now we are going to prove the coding theorem with it. Namely that the entropy is a lower bound on the number of bits. And I think that's pretty much where we'll end. The first thing is we're going to co generate the prefix code with length L of X is the seal of log, well, of minus log base two of P of X. So I take the binary logarithm of the probability for every event and I just round up to the next integer. Now, e to the minus that has to sum up to, well, sorry, two to the minus that, sum over all the strings has to sum up to less, th less equal than one, because all I've done is otherwise if I have two to the log, you know, that's just the sum of the over, let, let me write it out, it's easy <coughs> to explain. So the sum over p of x over x is one, right? Which is nothing else than the sum over x of two <coughs> to the minus minus log base two of p of x. Nothing special has happened. Which is, of course, greater or equal than the sum over x, two to the minus seal of minus log base two of p of x. Okay. And now this is exactly where the craft inequality can kick in. Because the craft inequality says, if I have this, then I can always find a prefix code. Okay. So what that shows, and of course, we know that this is actually, you know, this itself is greater or equal than one half. Why can I? Why, why, does the, uh, why does that upper bound hold? Is that, that lower bound hold? It's, uh, yes, so what happened is, if I go from minus log p of x to seal of log of minus log of p of x, then those two numbers will never differ by more than one, right? 
Because I just round to the next integer. Now, if I round to the next integer, well, the diff discrepancy can be not, no more than one half. Right? So this number can never be less than one half that number. And since that holds, and I know that this is one, this has to be one half. So that's what it means by saying, well, this is within one bit of the optimal code, right? Because the theorem claims that, you know, it's exactly, you know, log base two of pj, not the next integer up, right? Okay. Now, how do we go from, you know, log base two of pj to making this work exactly? Well, what we can do is we can just combine the data into k tuples, right? So that will drive all the probabilities down to something much smaller. But now since I'm combining, you know, k tuples, the rounding error of up to one will now get split over k probabilities. So that drives my rounding error to one over k rather than one. And if I make those k tuples long enough, then everything works out fine. Now, the optimality of that, uh, that there is no better code, goes with, through Kullback Library Divergence, and we'll do that on Thursday. Just one quick aside. So you might think, well, this is actually really nice, right? I mean, so coding theory is, is easy, right? So why don't we have optimal codes, right? Because after all, you know, I could just go and design some encoding algorithm. Well, the problem is that in order to make things work really well, I need very long sequences. And very long sequences make for very expensive decoders. And that's where, for instance, turbo codes come in. So if at some point you want to take an, a graduate level information theory class, they'll cover turbo codes and low density parity codes and all of that in a lot more detail. OK. So thanks for it today. The homework will be up later tonight, including the solutions for two weeks ago. Okay, good luck, see you on Thursday. <laughs>